Good afternoon. Good afternoon to all of you here and <clears throat> those of you watching the stream uh, around the world. Uh, it's lunchtime here in New York on a gray uh, early spring day, and we uh, have something very exciting uh, in store for all of us. I have to say that 20 million years ago when I was a graduate student myself, sitting in the manuscripts room at the Cambridge University Library, uh, I remember seeing a person uh, who might have been an earlier version uh, of Professor McLeod standing uh, with his McLeod portable collator comparing um, machine-wise different editions of books. And I remember uh, puzzling at this and wondering what was going on and, and wondering why it was so important. Uh, and that was a very long time ago. I've come to learn a few things since then. Uh, and we will all have the benefit of seeing this in action, I think, or seeing the kind of intelligence that is involved and was involved in creating that uh, machine in a moment. Uh, Randall McLeod uh, was educated at Harvard and the University of Toronto, where he spent his career in the English department and is now Professor Emeritus. Uh, he's been supported in his research by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, the Mellon and Guggenheim Foundations in the United States. He has worked in libraries and held fellowships at Harvard, Yale, and the University of Texas. He's worked in the field of textual criticism and focused intensively on the early modern period and on what we now understand to be the material text, but in his own way really um, the history of the making of a book and the intricate relationship between book history and bibliography in a materialized form that I think few scholars today uh, have an equal <coughs> mastery of. He is uh, in New York uh, for the wonderful exhibition on Aldous at the Grolier Club, and it is a great pleasure to bring him here uh, for us today. Uh, those of you who are not in the room and wish to ask a question, don't forget that you can tweet your questions to us at hashtag BardGradCenterTV, one word, hashtag BardGradCenterTV, and we can read your questions out during the question period. Uh, and with that, I turn the floor over to Professor McLeod. Thank you very much for coming. Um, this talk proceeds by my putting up a slide and then talking about it. Um, I can be interrupted at any time. So if you say, hey, what was that? Go back a slide. Uh, please feel free. Um, you won't throw me off. That's a slide of Chartres Cathedral. And I've added the words 16th century with an arrow pointing left and 12th century with an arrow pointing to the right. Nun symmetry in the facade of Chartres Cathedral makes one aware of stages of its construction. So let us read this octavo, the 15-1 Aldine Virgil, the first book printed in italics, that legacy of the late Quattrocento still going strong. This book is an octavo it's sheets with eight pages on that side and eight on the other side are folded like this and again and again to make a choir. And that's a picture of a choir after it's been folded, as I just shown, and now sewn, but before the plowing off of the bolts at the head and the foredge. You can't really read much of it until you've plowed off those bolts. Choirs have one side and another side. Um, I'm sorry, sheets have uh, one side and another. These are called forms. So the inner form and the outer. The compositor had to decide whether to set the pages in narrative order, one, two, three, four, or discontinuously by form. If you look to the left, he'd have to set pages 2, 3, 6, 7, 10, 11, 14, and 15, and impose them in that order you see there. Or he'd have to set 1, 4, 5, 8, 9, 12, 13, 16 for the outer form. In either case, there was the question of which form goes to press first. 
As readers, we can be sensitive to these chronological issues, and eventually, as this lecture will show, as discerning of the construction of this book as the viewer is of Chartres and its uh, facade. The choirs are assigned signatures. So the first choir has an A on the first leaf, an A2 on the second, an A3 on the fourth, third, and an A4 fourth, a four on the fourth, and the others are not numbered, the next four. Then you begin with B and C and so on. In this book, a lowercase alphabet from A to G is reserved for two texts, Virgil's Eclogues and the Georgics, and then a new alphabet of signatures begins for the Aeneid. Pages are not numbered. So the way you know the order of sheets in the book when you're sewing it is by looking at these signatures. When I look at a book, and I look at books more than I read them, and I look at them before I read them, I'm especially fascinated by blank pages or pages that are mostly blank. And I've identified some of them here. In the upper left, A1 Recto is the title page, which I've shown you, mostly blank, just with the word Vergilius in the middle. On the other side of it is an epistle and praise of the typecutter. So the book was self-consciously the beginning of a new typeface. Uh, then, um, uh, let's see. It's really, um, no, I'm confusing two things. Let me skip over to the right-hand side. Um, no, let me go back to uh, the next thing, G6 verso to 8 verso. Um, there is the introduction to the Aeneid and the text I've identified before. The Eclogues and the Georgics are now finished. Then with the red alphabet comes the Aeneid. And at the end, there's a short discussion on accents, which you see named in the upper right. Short listing of variants in another text, a manuscript in this case. And then there's the colophon. And when you turn over the last leaf, it's blank. I'll run through those blanks again. So first, there's the title page. Here it is again. Then there's the back side of the title page, A1 Verso, and that's what it looks like. The epistle is on the upper left, and below that is in grammatoglypti laudem, Laudem is praise, and grammatoglypti is typecutter. The last line of the three-line verses celebrates Francesco da Bologna, Francis of Bologna, who was the typecutter. Uh, people say he's surnamed Grifo. Now here at the end of Choir B, we come to the end of the eclogues, and there's a big blank space, that's what I want to read. You can see the Georgics just beginning on the right-hand side. At the back of the book, there is the colophon. And if I turn that leaf over, it's just blank. So this is the, the puzzle here, to look at those blank pages and to extract a text from them. I kid you not. OK, so let's start with the title page. There it is again. This is a British Library copy. It's printed on skin, not on paper. I like skin because it remembers the bite of the type much better than paper. Paper also is deeply bitten when it's printed, but paper, is, uh, paper books are usually hammered in the process of binding them to make them flat. Otherwise, it's like binding a pile of potato chips, and it's like full of air. You could sew it tightly at the spine, but it would flare out at the fore edge. So to get it compact, you beat it. And that obliterates a lot of the evidence that I need to read these blank spaces. Now the photograph there is taken with ambient light, just coming from all directions. Or perhaps it's light directed straight at it. But what I like to do is to shine a raking light across the page. So 
here's a light shining on my hand, but a raking light is like this. And now you'll see, I suppose, big shadows between the fingers, whereas this way you won't. So I want to create those shadows. When I shine a raking light on this British Library copy, you see that the page is full of typeface. Typeface without ink, but the type has bitten into the medium. There's a blow up of the headline, which you can read. Liber Primus, right? Book one. The line below it, where we expect Latin for Virgil, we find Tuscan. Tal qual di ramo in ramo si raccoglie. Well, that's, that's Dante. That's Purgatorio 28. This is the part of the Purgatorio where Dante and Virgil, who is a character in the Divine Comedy, have climbed so far up purgation that they come to the River Lethe, the River of Forgetting, across which they see the Garden of Eden. And at this point, Dante turns to Virgil, as he always does, for an explanation, but Virgil has nothing to say. So it's the moment of Virgil's silence that is blind here on the title page. <laughs> That's pretty neat. And then the next time Dante turns to Virgil, uh, Virgil's gone. So on the left is T4 verso in Dante. And you can see big chunks of text migrate onto the title page of the Virgil. <laughs> the problem is, the Dante was printed in 152, it says in its colophon. I've put the date at the bottom. And the Virgil's from 151. So, like, the future doesn't appear in the past, but it does. So, that's a problem. We'll have to figure that one out. So, that's how you read a blank page. The next blank is at the end of the eclogues. I jumped over two slides. There it is. That's the slide I showed before. That's a paper copy uh, at Princeton. Here's a paper copy in Chicago, and you may see little flecks of ink there. I'll circle them, and then I'll go back to the previous photo. Can you see those little flecks? So, there's text there, I'm pretty sure. Here's another paper copy. I can see more flecks of ink. And in what might be the last line, I can see the bottom of a rounded shape. It might be a C or an O or a Q. Here's a skin copy at the Rylands Library in Manchester. I can see biting there at the beginning of where lines would be. I can start throwing some guesses at it as to what those letters are. Here's the bottom of the page, more guesses. And here's the British Library copy. Don't have to guess no more. I can throw educated guesses at it now. So I've listed them horizontal now, and in the lower line I've divided them into groups of six with one left over, because I know what the right answer is. And now I'll take those groups of six in, in a row and I'll go through the parts of the book that have been printed already, that is choir A and choir B, the other half of it maybe. So that's like three forms. I can put this group of letters against and try and find a match. And there you see the middle group of six matches. The top one doesn't match and the bottom one doesn't match but the bottom one matches the top, and the top one matches the bottom, and the G is left over. So on the left, I've taken those three groups, I've changed their sequence, top goes to bottom, middle goes to middle, and bottom goes to top, and I've gone looking for a G line. Well, it turns out there are only two G lines 
in the first two sheets. One of them is on that page B8 verso in the middle, so it's out, and the only other one is on B7 verso. So I guess that's it. But you see at the very bottom of the B8 verso page, right there, I put a little arrow saying 38 millimeters, and at the end of that, I think in the original, I see uh, an F shape or a long S. And in this line from B7 verso, I don't see that. So that's the problem. So um, I'm giving myself a C plus on that and an A plus on the other side. So we'll have to entertain that question along with the Dante as we go forward. Now to try and figure out something here, I'm going to try and set up uh, information about a conversation among Virgil, Dante, and Statius. The conversation has already begun with that arc you see going from choir T in the Dante to the Virgil. I'm now going to bring Statius into the conversation. At the bottom of these three columns, you see dates that are coming from the colophons of those books. Uh, it's a question of whether we should trust colophons, but that's what they say. And the Statius has two colophons. Uh, there are different alphabets in, in the first book and the last book. So colophons come at the end of alphabetical sequences. Okay, so here is the last page in Dante. And you see there the famous logo of Aldo, which is expressed as festina lente, hasten slowly. That's a paper copy. In Chicago at the Newberry Library, there is a skin copy, and there's above the elf, um, anchor and dolphin. You see there is text there. Here it is straight on. In the headline, I can read T-H-E. Statius wrote a poem about Thebes, so that's what we must be looking at. At the bottom of the page, there's more. Here it is straight on. And I can read many of those letters, and it takes me here. O one verso in Statius, coming to H4 verso in Dante. So one book is talking to another again. And there's my arrow on the right-hand side, going from O in Statius down to H in Dante. Here's the end of the Purgatorio. And you can see there's text there in this paper copy. Here's another paper copy, this one um, in the Bibliothèque Nationale. This slide doesn't show it very well. I've taken the picture twice and I've thrown some letters at it. In the lower left-hand corner of this slide, I've recorded my guesses in the appropriate spaces. And then if you go to the right, you see the text I found that matches that. And on the far right, I've recorded m what my guesses should have been if they were correct. And you see I've got three of them wrong. For CL, well, my CL was a misreading of ET. My long S was a misreading of an FE ligature. My C was a misreading of O. So it's not as if you read this blind type. You have to decipher it, and it's problematic. But um, if you get a few of them right, you can stumble in the right direction and eventually get to where you want to go. So that's where it comes from. And here's another line on my map going from I in Statius to X in Dante. Okay, well, this is familiar terrain of one book talking to another. Now, here's a, a different kind of thing. This is a, a blank page between the Purgatorio and the Paradiso. I can read part of it. That perche, etc., is a reading of what's in the box just below. The slide is, um, if you were standing up close to it, I think you'd be able to read it. That's the source. And the little curlicue in the middle column going from Y to X is this new part of the map. 
Now let's look at the end of the inferno. There's also a blank page associated with this. And in the next slide, I'll show you this page and the blank together. They're on the right-hand side. And the sources are indicated on the left-hand side of this diagram. And once again, a later choir of one book is providing type to print blind in a previous choir of the same book. And that's the information I want to take forth to relate to the problem I showed you here. I thought that I should look for a G line in choir A and B, which I, as a narrative reader of books, assumes is what was already printed. So I assume that as I read the book, I'm following the schedule of production. But now I know that's not the way to go. Maybe I should look to the future. So I should go past the eclogues into the Georgics. And should I stop there, or should I go into the Aeneid? Or should I go into the next book printed? Well, if I go into the Aeneid, I find on A6 verso, right near the beginning, a long S in the word est, so it's an ST ligature. And that is the right distance. But I could go into the next choir and maybe find another one. So how far should I go? Looking for G lines with long tails 38 millimeters in. So I don't know whether I've got the answer. But I'll draw this map for what, what I mapped earlier. So you see, it's the same thing. This is full of detail, and this just gives the metadata, I guess you'd call it. Okay, so there's a lingering problem, but I've got this map, and I'm going to show you other maps like this, and we can build a big apartment building with arrows going up and down it at the end. Okay, now I'll go to a blank page uh, on the last leaf on the recto of it. It's the colophon. I don't have photographs of it, but this is my analysis. Something from the end of the first alphabet, remember it ends in G, is appearing on the last leaf of the book. And if I turn that leaf over and look at the blank Y4 verso, it also is getting something to print on it blind from the middle of the book. And that's the map I can make of that. The three dots in the middle just show the break between the alphabets. So the middle of the book is talking to the end. Now I'll go to the epistle, which is on the back of the title page. This is a skin copy from the Rylands Library in Manchester. And instead of a raking light this time, which skims along the leaf, it's light shining through the leaf. And here you see something very strange that when the type bites the medium, be it skin or be it paper, the medium becomes more translucent at the point of pressure. Whether it's because the medium is stretched or the compacting inhibits light less, I don't know. But I see the phenomenon all the time. <clears throat> There's a close-up of it. And the two lines just below the name Francesco da Bologna must be the Dante on the other side, I'm thinking. But the lines below it all begin with capitals and there's a space after them. That's the standard format. So that's the text I'm looking at on this side. It's pretty blurry, but you can make out some shapes are round. Say the first letter in the line, some shapes are round, some are rectilinear, so it's, it's a key, and when you get into it, you, you find that the end of the book is talking to the front. Remember X, Y, Y is the last choir, so this is the penultimate choir, and it's talking to the first leaf. Now let's turn this A1 verso over and go back to where we, well, that's the map of it, and go back to where we expect to see Dante. So we're looking for Dante now. That's the page from the Rylands Library copy again with light shining through it. There's no Dante. Once again, it's the end of this book 
that's talking to the title page. So both title pages say Wergilius, but in the silence, above and below, there are different texts and different copies. And that's pretty strange. So that needs some explanation. Let's put all those maps together. At the top, the arrowheads are present, so those long arrows coming from below are terminating at the top. And at the bottom, there are arrowheads with uh, arrows going back to the middle of the book. So it looks as if the book was done before it began. So fin ship it. Well, I want to explain now what's going on with the Dante copy. On the left is a paper copy of the 151 Virgil from Princeton, and on the right is the British Library copy. I've circled various types. I'll now show them in greater magnification. On the left, look at the LL in Amarillida. The two Ls don't touch each other. But in the right, they're very close, and their strokes actually join. In the next line, IS on the left, two separate shapes, but they are joined on the right. The same for US, the same for AS. There's a more advanced state of the case on the right, more sophisticated type. Those are ligatures. Two letters are being printed on a single block of type. When I turn the next page and, and look at the, uh, the Princeton copy and the London copy, the British Library copy, the same thing. There are sophisticated ligatures. And they go all throughout the first choir. And after that, the Princeton copy and the British Library copy are identical, not sophisticated ligatures. So what this tells me is that the first choir of the British Library copy reveals itself through these ligatures and through the Dante on it as something that was uh, a patch in that copy, something printed later. Well, when later? I guess when Dante was being printed in 152. There are also two bifolia scattered in the Aeneid, which also have these sophisticated ligatures. So I've begun looking at skin copies for sophisticated ligatures uh, popping up where they shouldn't be, and I find them in several different books. And this tells me that the printing of vellum is hard and in quality control, Aldous is canceling sometimes a whole choir, as in the Virgil in the British Library, and sometimes just bifolia in order to get clean text, which means he's resetting just here and there. Not pages, not leaves, but bifolia, because he wants a unit of two so he can sew it into the book. He needs that curve in the middle to stitch through. In the 18th century, printers will often uh, cancel a leaf and glue in another leaf that they've printed as a substitute. But Aldous does not do this. He works in bifolia. So that's a footnote. So talking about ligatures, there are 33 ligatured sorts for the first seven letters, A to F. Only B and D have no ligatures. So look at them. Yes, there's a G, but there's also a GA, and a GE, and a GI, and a GO, and a GU. Just above that, you see I've written FR slash FR. Well, there are two different FR shapes, conspicuously so by their slope, but also if you look at the construction of the R, the, the curve at the top, they are quite different. So not only a multiplication of ligatures, but also within a given letter combination, several varieties. So here's another 63. We're up to 100. 
Yes, there's a C, yes, there's a T, yes, there's an A, but there's also a CTA and a TA and a TTA. What all this is after here is the look of handwriting. If you have something like a Bauhaus aesthetic, you have one letter, one piece of type, you design it to look like type and you just string them along. But this man is using the type medium to imitate manuscript. I can enlarge upon that in a minute. Here you see some of these ligatures in action. I've underlined them. The second last one is an ME. No, the first one in the second line is an MO. Remember that shape. I'll show you its absence in a moment. Here are some more. And in the last line, the second last one is a CE. I'll show you that absent in a minute. But you see, they're everywhere. And it means when you go to set a word, uh, the number of actions of your hand reaching into the case and bringing it back to the composing stick is greatly reduced. So you can set this quite efficiently. Where it's not efficient is in that you have to create all these at the beginning, and you also have to construct a case with many more compartments than we're used to. Like just for the lower case, you would need, say, 130. There aren't that many letters in the alphabet, so if you're constructing a keyboard, you don't have 130 places to put your finger. So this is a modern aesthetic in front of me, and what Aldous is dealing with is a, uh, a very cumbersome one, but one that creates this effect which he must have thought eloquent and able to conjure up the antique aesthetic that he was interested in, the retro aesthetic. So let's start in the lower right-hand corner. With four types, you can set ten letters in the word gustasent. Or four types, nine letters, manifesto, manifestu, meminisse, fakesund, and so on. So spelling is not what's uppermost in the mind of a compositor. He's not thinking of atoms. He's thinking of molecules. Okay, now let me uh, try to get back to the early history of italics. This is a Roman type, obviously, and it's the end of a letter by Santa Caterina of Siena. She ends her letters with the formula, Jesu dolce, Jesu amore, sweet Jesus, Jesus love. This book has a wood block, and in it is the first appearance of italic type in the Bible she's holding in her right hand and the sacred heart in her left. Here's the Bible, Jesu dolce, Look at the CE in Dolce. It's two types. It's not a ligature. Jesu amore. Look at the MO in amore. Not a ligature. Now, SU is a ligature in advanced Aldine fonts. I wonder if this SU is a ligature. Well, there's something strange about that S. Almost all of Aldous's long S's do not have a spur. The spur is common, in fact, everywhere in Roman long S's, but not in italic. So this looks like a, a kind of uh, attempt at design which he abandoned. We can put all those SU's together, and I've indicated the slope of them. You have to be careful with the slope because the types that printed this were set into holes drilled into the block of wood. They're not lying on a composing stick, which is a flat metal surface. So take that with a grain of salt. But look at the lines establishing the height of the S's, and you see that the S with a spur is enormous. It's overweight. Well, that could be inking on that side of the plate, so let's not give too much attention to that. But it's much longer. That's a hard fact. So whether any of those is a ligature, I don't know, but we do see two varieties of something, be it an S or a long S, U ligature. To protect his uh, publications, Aldous got um, 
privileges from the Senate in Venice. He also got popes to sign on and threaten excommunication to anybody who didn't toe the law, but nobody listened to the Senate and no one listened to the Pope, even then. Aldo Romano ha fate lettere greche cum ligaturi che parno cum calamo, which I translate below. Aldo Romano has made Greek letters with ligatures, hey, ligatures, which appear penned. Di novo ha excogitato lettere cancellaresche sive corsive latine bellissime che parno scritte a mano. He has of late devised a Latin chancery or cursive letter of surpassing beauty, which seems handwritten. I doubt if it was the senator who wrote that praise of all those types. I think I know who wrote it. Of surpassing beauty. So you see the aesthetic there. It looks like handwriting. I know it's only a printed book, but it looks like manuscript. That's the model. Now, I don't recommend this machine because prolonged use of it turns your hair gray. <laughs> but if you use it, I should tell you something about it. The um, left eye of the young man in the picture is looking straight ahead at the rear tier of the two-tiered reading stand, where is sitting a copy of Orlando Furioso. And the other eye of that guy is looking into the ocular mirror with its wooden back, looking into the objective mirror and down at the other copy of Orlando Furioso. The distance between the mirrors is the distance between the two tiers of the reading stand. So the angular dimensions of the images coming to the brain through each eye are the same. If you move the books horizontally to a certain point, the two images lie on top of each other. If the printer has changed anything, in a line, say the word dog was spelled D-O-G-G-E, and now it's spelled D-O-G, the rest of the line has to move one way or the other when the G-E is added or taken away. And that horizontal displacement against the stable background of the rest of the page invariant generates a 3D effect. So when I turn to a page with a variant, I say, oh, there it is. You don't read along line by line until you bump into it. Just as if I say, on that wall there's a loudspeaker, you don't go panel by panel to find the loudspeaker, you just go to it. So when you use a machine like this, it takes about, well, it takes more time to turn the pages and make sure the alignment's right than it takes to see a variant. And once you've found a variant, then you take a long time analyzing it, but just to say whether a variant is on a page is something you can do in three seconds. Do you know about stop press variants? In the first hundred years of printing, it was not the custom to finish proofreading <laughs> before you began the print run. So some copies say to be or not, a hundred of those, and then to be or not to, 530. Then to be or not to be, yeah, 16. <laughs> then you could add punctuation at the end and change that. And then there's the other side with this variance. And everything the printers printed like this, they would put out in the marketplace. And then worms get some of them, fire gets some, and there are only 16 copies of 1,000 left after 400 years. And with a machine like this, you can reconstruct some of the variety Okay, so let's look at some of the variety in the Virgil. We're not looking at Virgil's variant between Pima and Prima. That's an Aldine variant. So one could say, are the skin copies saying Prima or Pima? Did they put the production of skin at the end of the run or the beginning? Well, in this case, the skin reads Prima. But what about the other side of the sheet? I would really need a variant there to know whether they printed the uh, skin copies last for this side, but maybe first for the next side. Because when you print paper, and skin too maybe, you wet it, and you print it when it's in a certain kind of wetness, and you don't want it to dry out too much, so you might finish the printing of um, the skin um, immediately. 
So you'd have it at the end of one form and the beginning of another. Unfortunately, there isn't a variant on the other side, so I can't pursue that any farther than the theory. Here we are with an Aldine variant again, not a Virgil variant. The signature should read N, but it was carried over, I suspect, uh, without adequate updating from the printing of the previous choir. <laughs> Except I now know not to think that the previous choir might have been the alphabetically previous choir. And it might be from some other book. Now we've got a Virgil, and, uh, Virgil variant, Campaniae, and look at the NI ligature. The sta other state is Campanae with just an N. So you couldn't say they corrected it by taking out the I. If you're thinking typographically, you know they had to take out the NI and put in an N. I think that the lower state is later because of the big space after it. Proper spacing, you might call it, is in the previous, the upper line. And here's a variant at the end. Now, you notice in the bottom line, the word faciesque has a CI ligature, after an FA ligature. That's made clear in the illustration at the left. So that's the normal way to set CI. But in the line above, the word Achilles, in neither of those variants has a CI ligature, which implies to me, since there's not a shortage of these types noticeable on the page, that the compositor wanted to set that accent between the C and the I. And in the setting at the left, he screwed up and put it between the A and the C. But then he removed it and also removed the space between the A and the C and he put the accent um, between the C and the I. Now, you may say that accent isn't sitting in the middle between C and I, so I'll explain that to you in a minute when I come to Kearns. Here's the last variant, and this is the one that's dynamite for the rest of the talk. The word aflawit appears in those two settings. The one on the left has an F and an FL ligature, and the one on the right has an FFL ligature. And you can see that the FFL ligature is a much more compact way to set those three letters, because the L is way to the left of the stroke of the Q, the descender of the Q, whereas on the left it aligns with it. So this is the kind of variant I love because it has nothing to do with pronunciation, nothing to do with meter, nothing to do with spelling, nothing to do with dictionary meaning, nothing to do with like allegorical or metaphorical meaning. It is a purely material typographical difference. So here's a model on the left of what the F, FL ligature setting is like. Exploded. And on the right, the same setting, compact. And the interesting thing that you may not have thought about is that there's a blank space between, a, print, a typographical space between the F and the FL. And the reason for that is now apparent because of the kerns. You'll see that the typeface of the F exceeds the perimeter of the surface it's resting on, the shoulder of the type. In order for italics to be elegant, these very curvaceous sl slopes of one letter must override the shape of another letter. And the only way to do that on a rectilinear framework like that is to have the letters kern off the edge. Kerns are vulnerable, and they need to be supported by the shoulder of the type uh, with the letter they're overriding, or if there's something already there in the space where that elegant curve wants to go, then you've got to put in a buffer, that uh, space I've shown you there. Now one thing I should say about the type bodies there, I've shown you, those are modern type bodies. I don't think they represent adequately the type bodies that Aldous would use, but I do claim that the typefaces I've shown are adequate representations. And that's what an FFL ligature looks like. 
You've still got kerning, but it's a much less vulnerable, and it's a more elegant form and looks more like handwriting. Here is an FG combination, and I have it here in my hand, and I'm going to pass it around. The way I've got it to pass around in a little thing that clamps it is in the reverse order. And the broken F of the kern is pointing toward the G that would break it off. But you can see with the F that it's kerning. You can also see that the G is kerning toward the F at the bottom. And you can see the broken off kern of the F. So I'm going to pass this around and I ask you to receive it in your hands and feel it before you look at it. And you will feel the kerns. And this tells you that when a typesetter sets type, he knows the moment he picks up a type by feeling it, whether it's a kern type or not. And if he's aiming for a kern type and he doesn't feel that, he knows it's broken or he's got the wrong type, either because he reached into the wrong compartment of the case or whoever loaded the case made a mistake. So um, because we're visually obsessed with books, we don't have a sense of this touchy-feely part of it by the person who made the book. But there it is. You'll feel it as it comes around. May I ask what's the date of this one that we're touching? Oh, it's a 20th century type. OK, so the Aflawit stuff I showed you is in the middle. I'm curious now about when Aldous would use an FFL and when he'd use an FFL. So that variant is found, the one in the middle, with my machine. When I look earlier in the book, as you see represented at top with the example from A8 Verso, I see only the FFL. And when I look later from the variant I found, I see only the FFL. So we know already that we can see primitive type in one book and more sophisticated type in another. And now I'm saying we can see less sophisticated type and more sophisticated type in the same book. And the display here going from A to C to D makes me advance the theory that they started printing this book with less sophisticated type. And during the print run, more sophisticated types came on stream. And, oh, stop the press. We've got a more sophisticated, OK, Jim. And they stop the press. And they go to the work of taking all the type out. It's heavy. If you drop it, you start again. You loosen all the pressure. You make your little change. You tighten up. You screw up. Put it back in the press. That takes 10 minutes. So that's um, an indication of how important getting the right look is. So with all this bibliographical information about the look of the book, where should we start reading? Well, we have only a few minutes, so I'll start reading here, between the lowercase alphabet and the uppercase alphabet. So there's G8 verso and A1 recto. So I'm looking carefully at these pages, and I know that ligatures are an issue. And I see that on the left-hand page, UA is always a ligature. I've circled it, and up above, I've represented the UA in a circle. But on the right-hand page, UA is never a ligature. It's always set with two types, and I've put that in a square. Now, in, on the right-hand page, between the two squares, that I've underlined a UA. It's in the word qualm. That's not a candidate because QU is a ligature. So that U is married to the Q and is not free to go off and marry the A. So Now, wherever you see a white circle, I'll represent it black in the next slide, on the, on the left only. And here's another letter combination. NT is always a ligature on the left not on the right. Well, that's just like this. The modern setting is on the left, or the modern architecture is on the left, and the older architecture is on the right. So here we are again. Modern in on the left, older in on the right. 
and new, same, and o, same, new ligatures, un, um, ne, me. Now I'll go later in the alphabet where I've got two and three. I'll look between N and O choirs, and then in a minute between O and P. So N8 verso on the left and O1 recto on the right. I M on the left is old, where we expected perhaps new. And the new stuff is on the right. Well, that's what we've expected, and this is what we've got. More of the same. More of the same. Now we'll go to the third position between choir O and choir P. New ligatures appearing on the right this time, again, N-O and U-M. UN. So a dozen new ligatures we've seen so far. And this is what I make of it. The way I've displayed the choirs in the book is represented at the top, and the new way to represent them is at the bottom. At the top is the way we think we read the book, from front cover to back. At the bottom is the way I'm trying to characterize the way the book was printed. Um, um, there are summaries of where we've just been along the bottom. Right here is the FFL ligature. I didn't tell you about TTE and TTU, but I did show you this stuff in Choir N. And look what I'm able to do with Choir N. I've split it into the outer form and the inner. So the caption for the N outer says the new ligature, can you read it? What is it? You at the front, UA? Okay, so UA appears in N outer and in N inner and everything off to the right. But if you go to NI, you find new ligatures NT, UU, and eventually in the last pages of it, IM. They don't appear in N outer, but they do appear in everything to the right of NI in that line. So this is answering the question of whether the compositor set page one, then two, then three, then four, inquire in. And no, he didn't. He set page one, then four, and then five, and then eight. And the next day he would set two and three, and six and seven, and so on. And I can do that with O as well. I can do it later on with U. It looks like a V, but U is its name. A new ligature, SP, comes on there. It's not found in Y, so I want to put Y before you. Now, a curious thing about the way I've organized that is you see the blue letter A appears at the first of the blue letters and also at the end of the whole sequence. And this A is a problematic page, we know, because it's, in fact, the leaf is problematic because it's got text from the end of the book on it. Now, in that line, I've represented the end of the book as printed just before it. So that would explain why type would be dead and ready to recycle blind in A. But why was it printed twice? Let me touch on that now. This uh, represented at the top is two versions of the Sophocles title page. It's colophon dates it 15.2. The version on the left gives you um, the author and the title. And the version on the right lists the plays. So at the bottom, I've taken two versions of the latter state. I assume it's the latter state. And I've made, uh, what I'll do is I'll make a transparency of one of those, and I will lay it onto the other and align it to get um, everything uh, fair and square. So I've done that here, and you see in the first four lines, I can align it perfectly, but with the list of the plays, I can't align it. And that tells me that the lines you see up above and the lines you see below were printed at different times, and the printer was not able to get good register. Usually when you print a, a, a sheet, 
you have two pins that stick into it so that when you turn it over, you can put the holes in the sheet right onto the pins again, and then you get a perfect register. For some reason, when Aldous um, added stuff to this page by putting it in the press again, he never uh, worried about the exact alignment. Here's another example, this time from 15.1, the very year of the Virgil. Anything look funny to you on that page? Don't read it, just look at it. Like, look at it upside down, just as a con. Not centered. Anything else? Mm hmm. Which lines aren't straight? Bottom three. Okay, now this is from the Huntington Library copy, and the page facing it is blank. And you can see there's been offset. So either the, well, it's likely the oil in the ink rather than the black in it has set off over time. Now I've taken that page on the right and I've flipped it mirror image uh, because offset is mirror image, so I'm compensating for that. And what I notice is that the darkest lines on the page don't set off. So it looks to me as if they, they belong to another universe. So I have three copies here and I make um, two transparencies and I lay it on the third. Oh, I guess I've made two transparencies. Now in the upper right you see the I'm not getting perfect alignment, but that's because the text is curving into the gutter. I think the alignment of the top lines, the top five lines is good. It's the lines below, which bear the date, 15-1, that are problematic. So I'm now going to take this stylus and I'm going to carve into this table four. 1991. This table is pre-Columbian. This book was printed in 1501. Yeah? You want to buy the Brooklyn Bridge? <laughs> so it is a very common thing that title pages go into the text or go into the press more than once uh, per side. So this first sheet has gone in three times, once for the outer form, once for the inner form, and once again for the outer form. Has everyone had a chance to see these types <coughs> down this side too? Everyone got it? Did you? Good. Need, eh? You'll never forget that, that there's a feel to type. Okay, so I'm coming back now to this problem of the G line with a, an elaborate slope of an F or an S shape 38 millimeters in. Remember, that's in B, small b. And I thought, well, maybe I should look ahead into the Georgics and beyond into choir A of the Aeneid, where I showed you that good example. But choir A of the Aeneid is ancient history. It's way back there at the beginning of the left, uh, the lower line, the left end of the lower line. If I want to look back into the past, I should look to choir T. So the source might be there. And indeed, in choir T, I find a G line with a slope 38 millimeters in. There's the S of Crespite. I'm not sure that's the right answer. Maybe I should go back to S. But I now think I have a more intelligent search pattern. So I'll discard that other one, and I should move the question mark down to the lower one. Because I don't feel I've solved it yet, but I've got a more intelligent method. So I'll cancel the pink on the left, and I'll advance tentatively the pink on the right. Another arrow coming up from the bottom of the page. So this is the end of the project, I guess, going back to kindergarten and learning a new alphabet. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, Y, U, X, A, 
are the letters of the alphabet, unless there's some that I for I did forget these letters over here. The programmatic use of long-tailed I and U begins and ends in choir A and B. So in the dawn, before the ligatures, look at that virumque there, arma virumque. This is the beginning of the setting of italic type in this book. The U of virumque has a long tail, and the I has a long tail. Compare the qui at the end of the line, underlined in black, short-tailed U, short-tailed I. Here's the I in primum, short tail, in primus, long tailed. And then in impia, when they finally, later in the book, did have an I am ligature, that's what it looks like. So he was trying to make it look like handwriting, trying to join letters before he had the ligatures. Let's do it with the U. You notice at the top, it's a short tailed U. The Juno is exquisite. It fooled me for a year. I said, what is that advanced ligature doing in this primitive Garden of Eden? But you see the tiny little break in it? I thought, that, well, that's just a little damage on the type. But no, it's the dividing line between two types that are kissing each other so passionately that I thought they were mm, one. And when you finally get the UN ligature, you see it at the bottom. And you see that the two strokes, the last of the U and the beginning of the N, are much closer together. So I've underlined in red where the long strokes are and in black where the short ones are. They're about 50-50 on this page. It goes on like this for the first two choirs and then it stops. All the long tails are gone. And there's a period without ligatures and without long tails and then the ligatures trickle on stream. The ligatures aren't always used when they're available. Here are words beginning with con. If you've studied Latin, you know that con is a preposition. And the words you're looking at here are compound words, like upscale. You take a preposition, up, and you add it to a noun, and you've got a compound. He won't use, and that's where the square is, he won't use an ni ligature. But in a word like enim, which you see in the third line, the N and the M never separate and go different directions in grammar. So that's where he'll use a ligature. Well, this is very sophisticated. It doesn't have anything to do with representing Cicero, whom you see here. It has to do with Aldo Minuzio in his sense of language, morphology of language. That's the page which I drew that sample from. Um, it's hard to read, I realize, but I've picked the 1540 Cicero to put beside it. And on the left, you see circles for words like enim and squares for words like conjunx. But on the right, it's the son of Aldus, Paolo, and he's setting all squares. This guy has given up his dad's ligatures. Um, this is too hard to see, so I'll go on to this point. Remember this variant, a flowet? Well, the AF of a flowet used to be AD, and the D gave up its sound and took on the sound following it. AD is a preposition. So this, too, is a compound word, ad flowet. But when he invents the FFL ligature, he is eclipsing that point of junction between the preposition and the rest of the compound. So this is going in the other direction from the con that I showed you just a minute ago. And I'm sure that Aldous understood the etymology that the af used to be an ad because in some words in the Virgil, he's using the older form. Instead of saying afflictus, he says ad flictus. So he blows hot and cold around this issue of the morphology of Latin. And I'll finish off with this example from my German to English and English to German dictionary that tells me I would have been much smarter about this part of my lecture if I'd been German rather than English. Look at the word aufforsten. It means to plant a forest, or the English word is given farther in to a forest. Look at the English word a forest. It has an FF ligature. 
but the German word Aufforsten does not. And at the end of that first line, Aufforstation in the English, well, that uses it. If we go down to the next line, the English to German, Aufforst, it's using the ligature. The German Aufforsten is not. And in the following line, Aufforstung, or Aufforstung, in German is not using it. If you look at the very last line where it says Schiff, you will see the Germans using the ligature. But the two Fs in Schiff never come apart for grammatical reasons. And so the Germans always use a ligature at that point. But if it's a separable prefix, like auf, they will not use the ligature, like preparing for its separation. So that's my talk. Having, uh, <clears throat> having looked through Professor McLeod's electron microscope <laughs> into the text, we can now understand something about what, what a material text looks like on the molecular <laughs> and atomic. Yes, so, sir. Floor is open questions. Yes, please. <clears throat> All right. Okay, if you could just talk a little bit about why um, it would have been uh, Desirable to have type look like handwriting at that period. Like, where, what's the impetus for for this? Well, in my neighborhood, somebody built a garage and they built the walls and then put a steel beam across here, and then they built a keystone arch of brick in front of it. The keystone arch of brick is not supporting anything. It's man, it's the look. You want to sell a house, you make it look ye olde. <laughs> So I think when he's joining letters like that, he's cultivating ye olde look. So it's a retro aesthetic. I would just say I was struck by your image of the, um, the woman holding the book in which the... Yes, St. Catherine. St. Catherine, thank you. Um, I mean, that's obviously meant to evoke a manuscript book. So I, obviously the, the, the same <coughs> use of on the heart is maybe harder to explain. That's handwritten as opposed to printed, but am I right in, in suggesting that that's, it's, if that is indeed the first use of italics, as you suggest, that that's, it's, it's a way of visually signifying this is... Yes, well, I, I think that people would have said, how the hell did that get there? Like, it's unprecedented, and it would look like manuscript. Yes, so I think you're spot on with that. Yes, sir. Oh. Just to go back to the question that the gentleman asked initially, uh, is it not that there was prestige attached to Italic ever since Niccolo Niccoli did research in Swiss monasteries and therefore throughout the 15th century, Italic handwriting was associated with uh, a high humanistic education, so it would carry prestige to print in Italic as well as writing. Yes, I think you're absolutely right there. It's got, um, it's got the flavor of humanism. Right. I agree entirely. Yeah. Um, so, how many people in the, in the print shop would have been aware of all of this? I mean, would, would it be just, just the, the, the person who is touching the type? Or would it be also... I mean, I know there are lots of different, highly specialized people printing books at this, in this period. So well, in the shop of Valdo Minuzio especially, he's the first printer of the Greek texts of Aristotle, Plato, Sophocles, Euripides, Herodotus, Theocritus, Hesiod, blah, blah, blah. And there are very, very complicated ligatures in Greek. His typesetters speak Greek. And they're fine if they speak Italian. <laughs> and when the pot of money fills up, they have a feast. So they're very knowledgeable people. So they're actually making choices at, at every at every moment, taking yes. the from the text that they're using as the rough copy, you know, the, as the dra the draft. They have like a, a piece of a manuscript that they're setting, yes. and they're reading that and deciding at every point that they're going to take 
something that, that's a ligature or that's not a ligature. Yes. And and do you think there's is there a rationale for that? All every single decision that's made is is every choice deliberate? Although I'm very old, I wasn't alive at that time. I can't say. But I, I think I'm working with very intelligent people. Uh, they goof up occasionally, and they goof off occasionally. Uh, they introduce jokes and puns and things. So um, I think I'd have to answer on a case-by-case -case basis if it showed me something. For example, at the uh, Morgan, uh, you will see in one of the display cases um, an ode by Pindar and the word Aido was set as Aldo, and Aldo was the name of the printer. And the, uh, someone has written an article to appear in the Princeton Library Quarterly, or whatever it's called, saying that this is an Aldine joke. Uh, I have to think about the ligature. Is AI Alpha Iota a ligature? If it is, um, then Aldo would never be a mistake for Aido. But if Alpha and Iota are not ligatures, then a, a lambda could be a mistake for an Iota. So that's an example of um, a, a big issue. Is it an intentional misprint? Very, very clever and sophisticated, nudge, nudge. Um, but I wouldn't want to comment on it till I see what the ligatures are in that font. I mean, in the same way as in your. Uh your patron, the Igu, right? There, there are the two layers of the compositor's history, which you talked about here today, and let's say the corrector's mm -hmm. history. How do they fit together? Because books printed from back to rear, back to front, and then with changes made all throughout, like this, at the compositor's level. At the same time, the printed text is being read and corrected mm -hmm. and redone. How do the two layers of the reworkings of the thing that we might call the text fit together? <laughs> well, I, I need a particular instance, and this was a particular instance. Do you have something in mind? Like any text? Choose one. No. You have to tell me, I'm afraid. You began by saying what I said about the Egu. I've you know, written the, about the Egu. The, 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 the Victor Hugo piece about oh, the chart. Oh, sewers. Yeah. And, okay, what was your question again? So, looking at the way the sheets are put together and changes made for one sort of reason, yes. and then the way in which other kinds of semantic changes are made for other sorts of reasons, how, how, do, how do they fit together? Well, again, it would come down to specific issues, but I think they fit together sloppily. I mean, I have a, a range of examples in which I say, well, they discovered the problem too late and their solution is not satisfactory. 50% of the copies in this case are okay, but these ones are not. Um, all this often goes through books and does hand correction in them. Hand correction may appear only in specific copies, like large paper copies. So you have to divide it up. Is it on skin? Is it on paper? On blue paper? On large paper? Is it from the beginning of the run or later in the run? Um, so the whole thing, uh, the whole idea that you could take an edition and pick one copy and say, oh, well, that's what it is. Um, my work with the collator convinces me that I need to see like 40 or 50 copies of a 16th century edition before I have a sense that I got You've got a good idea of what the traffic is. There's all to and fro and no copy is the same as any other. And I showed you on the title page here, you could have Dante on one and you could have Virgil on the other as bearing type. I'm working now with the 15.5 ESOP and the, the ink type is the same, but the bearing type, the blind type at the bottom of the page, is different in different copies. 
So part of two lines exist horizontal at the bottom of the title page in one copy. And a later part of the first of those lines appears vertical in other copies. Oh, there's a wonderful example of uh, a text. Um, it's a Thomas Aquinas, printed in uh, 1479, I think. And it's in two columns. So there's the last page. There's the solid column, and then a little short column, which comes to a point, I think. And uh, Aquinas says at the end of that, Deo gracias. And at the bottom, blind, in Gothic type, it says, and this stuff is Latin, of course. Down here it says, I've forgotten the name. Oh, yeah. Gerhard and auch Thomas drücken mit gutem Fleiß ist das Ende, so ist das alles. Amen. <laughs> so we too are uh, printed with good industry, but it's the end, so that's all. Um, amen. So there are conversations that go on. Uh, in this blind area. So there's a whole world under there. And it, it, uh, with a raking light, uh, you know, you can, you can bring it out. Like that. Uh, what's on this point? Well, just, uh, how do you find that this continues, you know, until the end of the hand press period? That these, this, I mean, how late have you seen these? Because you're looking now and you know, this, in the Aldine era, mm -hmm. even into the 16th century. But what about in the 17th century? And does does the, the increase well, in the volume of printing um, sort of do some of these? Yes, the, the short answer. I think the the rate of uh, presence of these things declines. But I, I should tell you uh, why there is this blind type on pages. In the old press, there was a bar which you pull like that. And when you do that, it turns a spindle which has a screw thread on it down like that. Balanced at the bottom of the spindle is a platen, a flat thing, which presses the paper down onto the upturned inked faces of the type. Now, if you're dealing with a type here, which is just the end of a chapter, and this thing is pressed down on it, this Platen is unstable, and with more turning of the spindle, it will tilt like that, and it won't give an even impression. So you have to put type under the whole thing to support the platen and keep it flat. So it's not just that these printers were putting Kilroy was here, down, <laughs> you know, little out of the way corners. They were obeying the law of physics and supporting the platen. Um, so in um, let's see, uh, Mariah Edgeworth, Practical Education, 1789 or 99, I can't remember which. Um, pages that are partly blank have bearers on them, but they look to me like um, slugs of metal, and they're put kind of off the text area. So that kind of physics is still uh, a problem, but what they put there is I haven't seen such interesting things later on. Final question, Jeffrey? Well, there were two actually, but they're both about sort of the audience reception or the, the, the buyers of the book. One, I'm coming again from an 18th century example. I'm working with a multi volume catalog where, again, the dates that are on the title pages, I know from archival evidence, are not accurate. And yes. I, I have my ideas of why they were trying to suggest that they complied with the contractual obligation that they hadn't. I wanted to know what, what is at stake in your material of dating quite specifically uh, Colophon misleadingly. And then the second question is, you mentioned that all the copies are sold, whether they're the latest ligatures or not. And do you have any suggestion of speculation of how how these things were merchandised? Were they all in one stack? And when a really discerning customer would come in, all this would select a better one from the bottom? Or, I mean, how, how would this work? Or are the early, you know, faulty ones discounted? I mean, do we have any evidence for this at all? So, so both in a sense, what, you know, what people thought they were buying versus, you know, what um, the printers are, are actually making. Well, among the paper copies, I can't speculate, but I do know that the uh, vellum copies were high-end 
uh, for high-end sales. And um, I learned from a lecture at the morning yesterday that um, the, the speaker felt that they weren't all um, created for specific customers in advance, like paid for in advance, and this one is for Duke so-and-so, and this one is for the senator so-and-so, but that they were um, dolled up, uh, maybe rubricated, um, and maybe some of them bound and uh, just waiting for the right person to come in with a big bundle of money and take them. Um, Isabella Deste wrote and said, I'd like to see um, all of your vellum copies of these octavos. And he sent them to her and she said, well, that's too much money. <laughs> so, you know, he had things ready to vend on demand. Speaking of demand, um, it's 1.30 and so there's some demands in the back of class. I want to, before we thank uh, Professor McLeod for today's wonderful talk, just to remind you that in a scant four, five, five hours, four and a half hours, uh, there's another talk here, uh, also uh, on Italy mostly, about crocodiles uh, and were crocodiles pieces, were they objects, pieces of material culture or not in the early modern period. That's Paul Finland from Stanford later today. It's, for those of you watching as well. Uh, and now it's a great pleasure really to thank Professor McLeod for absolutely uh, spectacular uh, trip into the molecular level of printing. Thank you very much. Thank you.